a transition into what we, you know, last couple of days we've been working with these rectangular equations, change them into polar, take the polar, change them into rectangular, um, and see if they, they generate the same thing. Okay, now we haven't done a whole lot of graphing by hand, but we've used GeoGebra to assist with that and to see that type it in, in in polar form, get a graph, type it in rectangular form, get a graph, the graphs should mesh. They should be the same thing. Okay. Um, now the way if we go all the way back up here, I guess, I guess in this situation, because remember, if I wanted to graph what R equals negative two sine theta there on the right uh, in black looked like right here. Okay. We ran through a independent variable of theta and just chose thetas that came off the unit circle, right? We plug them into negative two sine theta and see what that generates for R. If we graph those points. And, what, and we'll talk about a, a technique that we use for graphing here in a little bit. There, there's a procedural thing that you got to be aware of. Um, but that should then generate all the order pairs that we need to create essentially our circle. Okay. That is kind of a segue into talking about these common graphs here. Okay. So we talk about these as being common graphs. It's like going back to algebra and saying, okay, we know what Y equals X looks like. We know what that parent graph looks like. We know what the parent graph of x squared looks like. We know what the parent graph of x cubed looks like. We know what the parent graph of maybe the absolute value of x looks like. So we, so we had a bunch of these parent graphs, right? Okay. These are a bunch of, not it's not limited to these, but these are the most common um, polar graphs, okay, or polar curves. The ones in the first row are the ones that we've talked about the most in regards to the equations that we were manipulating the last couple of days, okay? If you have R equals A, R being radius equals a number, that number is the radius that generates the circle. Okay? So R equals A is the format for any circle. If you want to take that circle and you want to move it up and down the y-axis, if you want to slide it and essentially dilate it, in this case we'll be shrinking it, uh, if A is greater than um, 1, you'll shrink the circle. If it's bigger than 1, you'll increase the circle. Uh, the radius size, but uh, you take A sine of theta, and that will give you that circle positioned uh, essentially tangent to the x-axis. Does that make sense? Okay. If I go R cosine theta, it gives me the circle tangent to the y-axis. If I wanted to flip them, if I wanted to flip this one down here or this one over here, all I've got to do is negate the A, and it will make that transition or transformation, okay? One we haven't talked about is obviously not using even a uh, trig value to, um, or trig function to evaluate into. It's just R equals A times theta, okay? So let's say A is, I don't know, 2. So then I take a theta of 0, multiply it by 2. Take a theta of uh, pi over 6, multiply by 2, and that gives me my R. Take um, theta of pi over 4, multiply by 2, and that gives me my R. Does that kind of make sense? And if you keep doing that, and then you plot them, what you end up with is a spiral like that. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is doing that. If I go R equals A times theta, create a slider for A, okay, that ends up being, so if I have, like, let's just go to 2A, two, two or A equals 2, so it's 2 theta. So one of my points would be, um, let me write this down so we can see actually what I'm evaluating into. So R equals 2 times theta. If I'm creating a list of um, polar coordinates, okay, choosing theta to be zero, that would give me, oh, zero, right? So zero, zero gets plotted, okay? If theta is um, pi over six, then two pi over six would be R, correct? If we go pi over three for theta, then 2 pi over 3 would be R. And if I plot those, 
Okay, so obviously zero, zero gives me that point there. If I go um, two pi over six, pi over six gives me that point there. If I go two pi over three, pi over three gives me that point there. And if I keep doing that, choosing theta and then doubling them for the R value, I'm going to get that spiral. Does that make sense? And as I increase the coefficient A, the only thing that's going to happen is that that spiral is going to grow in kind of its breadth, okay, its width. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, if we make it negative, it just produces that reflection. So those are spirals. Uh, these other ones down here, okay, these are where it gets a little bit more complex. Let's see here, where'd they go? All right, now these, these words are Greek, not Greek, sorry, Latin, I believe. Uh, Limason, okay. Uh, I'll do a quick Google search here. Maybe it's French or Latin. Okay, so Limasson, French, literally snail. That's what it means. Um, so evidently this, some for whatever reason, maybe looks like a snail or whatever. Okay. Um, what happens, though, is that we're looking then at a, and I'm, I'm going to do the sine one, okay, um, they're saying that A is less than B. So this number here is going to be less than that number there. So if I go like 2 plus 5 sine of theta, if I type that in and let that be the rule that generates R. So R equals 2 plus 5 sine theta. Okay, that is my... Limason, okay? And what's happening there, just kind of think about what's going on here. We're going to take a theta and plug it in to generate R. So let's take theta to be zero. If theta was zero, what's sine of zero? What's sine of zero? It's just zero, right? So then I have five times zero, which is zero, plus my two. So my R is 2 when theta is 0, plot that, I get a point right there. And this is how you would go through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually hide this real quick. This is how you would go through. You would plot the first point where theta is 0. Now I'm going to go theta to be pi over 6, okay? So if I put pi over 6 in here, what's the sign of pi over 6? What's the sine of pi over 6? Nobody knows? Isn't it 1 half? Okay. What's 1 half times 5? 2.5, right? Okay. What's 2.5 plus 2? 4.5. I plot that point. Okay. Now, here's where graphing polar graphs are a little bit different than maybe rectangular graphs. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to connect those, okay? Or maybe maybe if you don't want to connect them right away, you you need to realize that this one was plotted first, that one was second, and then what will come up with third, and so, so that you connect them correctly. Does that make sense? Okay. Because uh, if I put a bunch of points on here and forget the order that they were connected, I might I might have and I go through and connect them haphazardly. I might not generate the correct curve, okay? So I'll kind of demonstrate that here in a little bit. Um, if we go theta to be pi over 3, then the R value would be, so sine of pi over 3 is radical 3 over 2. Then if I add or multiply that by 5, I get 5 radical 3 over 2, okay? So I'm going to just write 2 plus 5 radical 3 over 2. Oh, that needs to be pi. And I get that point. OK? 
Okay. Then I'm going to go pi over 2. So sine of pi over 2 is 1 times 5 is 5 plus 2 is 7. So R will be 7. Theta will be pi over 2. And I get that point, right? So if, if I had these four points and I don't remember the order that they were plotted, I might go D to A to B to C or D to C to A to B, right? Does that make sense? Okay, I need to remember that there are A, B, C, then to D. And if I start connecting those along with all of the, as I go through up to 2 pi and sometimes more than 2 pi, and I connect them with a smooth curve, those are going to be the points that I get, okay? It's very important, especially on, like, that region there, when you start getting those points plotted, that you remember the order, okay? So that you can get that correct inner loop, okay? Now, what happens is as we – I'm going to change this to um, a B value, and we'll change this to a C value. Apply, create sliders for those. What? All right, so I just delete this. I'm just going to write um, R equals um, B plus C times sine of theta. There we go. All right, so if if that number, so this was C was 5 and B was 2, that's the limason that we just came up with. We call that a limason with an inner loop, okay? As these two numbers, so if that is when this number here is smaller than that number. When this number 5, which is, again, this coefficient here, when that starts getting closer to B's value, what is happening to that inner loop? Other things are happening, but what is happening to that inner loop? It's getting smaller and smaller, right? It's decreasing in size, okay? Eventually, when those two numbers are the same, we get something like that, okay? And what happens is that we have no longer an inner loop, okay? We get to that point, and then we bounce back um, oh, wait, we don't, we don't, like I said, we don't have an inner loop, okay? So that shape, flip it upside down, what's it look like? Looks like a heart, right? Okay. Last class said it looked like a butt. Um, but, um, <laughs> more appropriately, I think, for the math class, it's a heart. Um, so they call it a cardioid, okay? Cardio refers to your heart, right? Okay, so those are called cardioids. Now, we can keep going, okay? So, we can, so now we, we see what happens when, when the, the coefficient here is bigger than the constant. We see that that merges eventually to a cardioid where there is no inner loop. Beyond that, okay, now it looks like, um, I think it looks like an apple, Okay, but they call this a limason with a dimple, okay, or a dimpled limason. Um, and then when this number is more than twice, so when this number here is more than double that one, okay, we get this shape here. Okay, so it's kind of just, it looks like a circle. Okay, but if I put a circle on top of that, there it, it's, it's a distorted, it's not a perfect circle there. Um, they call that a convex limason. Um, but that's how those shapes are generated, okay? Um, if we want to look at, so that those are limasons. And again, guys, I'm not going to have you do a whole lot with these things. I just want to introduce them to you so you've seen them. Um, if you ever need to use this stuff later on in the field that you go into, it will be introduced again. Um, we have roses, okay? So A sine of 
in theta. So let's go ahead and look at what that looks like. We can we can and on all of these guys we can in, insert the so I can replace sine with cosine and all it does, just like what it did with circles, it just now places it on the x axis instead, right? And we can still so that would be a cardioid, okay, dimpled limason, convex limason. Um, but if we want to go and figure out what, so if R equals, uh, I'm just going to say B sine of C times theta. Okay, now this gets, it gets kind of weird looking right now because of the fact that my B's and C's are not whole numbers. Um, when, so I'm going to take this B, so B, or B is the multiplier, okay, so the C is what I want, or, no, sorry, flip them that way, yeah, okay, so all that B value is doing, which is the multiplier out here, okay, just like anything that in college algebra that value would have done, it's just stretching it, right, it's making it bigger, correct, so it's a dilation, essentially, um, I'm going to make the C value oscillate between, uh, let's just go 1 to 10, but I want it to be integers. Okay. So when, so B sine C theta, okay, so this would be 2 sine, uh, sorry, 1.7 sine of 2 theta. We get that right there, which they call a rose. Um, if I were to make the sine go to cosine, it's the same rose, but you see that it's now rotated essentially 90 degrees, right? Okay. Um, so if you want to do the sine, or you want to do the cosine, you're going to get a rose. But the relationship is that if if the Number right here, if that multiplier of theta is even, then you'll have twice as many petals. So it's a two and that's even, so I'll have four petals. If it's three, I have three petals. If it's four, I have eight petals. If it's five, I have five petals. If it's six, I have 12 petals. Does that kind of make sense? If it's an even number, if the multiplier is an even number, you'll have twice as many petals. If it's an odd number, you have exactly that many petals, okay? The odd, what happens is going between 0 to 2 pi, you will trace out multiple kind of repeated points going all the way to 2 pi. When it's an even number, those points don't repeat themselves, so they become unique individual points. Therefore, that's why we get extra petals. Um, and we can go as far as we want to with that. But those things would be very difficult to come up with using rectangular coordinates, rectangular equations. Okay. Um, the, and I'll show you here in a little bit some, some different things that we can do. These are, like I said, these are just common graphs. They're not the ones that we see all the time. Um, or I guess I want to say they're not the only ones that we see. These are limbless gates. They look like the uh, the infinity sign. Okay, uh, they look like uh, maybe two leaved roses, um, but they're of that form. Okay, um, kind of show you some of this stuff. We're just gonna mess around with this. Uh, if I go, let's take this. Let's start with a a rose. Let's add to it. Maybe we type in tangent of maybe b theta. See what that does. Multiply. And then close that off. Apply. So you get some weird stuff to happen when you change and add different components. Okay. Um, now some of these things have symmetry, some of them don't. Um, the circular nature of them uh, generates a, the potential for a lot of symmetry. Uh, you can start doing all kinds of weird stuff with these. 
Uh, I think did I show you guys the butterfly at the beginning of the the 8.1 stuff? Okay, you can you can do all kinds of different unique shapes. Um, you know, if we just multiply, let's actually make this. Let's put the secant in here and make this tangent the argument of the secant and see what happens there. You start to get some just get some odd, weird things going on. Uh, all kinds of Maybe we square something here. Uh, let's throw a cosine in as well. Let's go cosine of maybe B theta. Oh. Well, I messed it all up. There we go. And start seeing different. I think that secant in there is kind of messing stuff up, making it really boring looking. Well, but you get the idea. Um, if you did a quick Google search of like um, polar graphs or polar equation graphs or unique polar graphs, you're going to see a lot of different shapes that you would not be able to generate using rectangular coordinates. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, these are the, you know, if you think about going, make, make the connection back to, the connection back to algebra, okay? Algebra, we start with lines, um, quadratics, uh, anything else that's polynomial, and we, we mesh those together, we start to get other graphs, right? Okay. Um, same thing here, okay? These are our, kind of our founding preliminary parent functions, mesh them together, um, and you start to get more interesting, uh, maybe more dynamic uh, curves. <clears throat> All right, so I don't want to spend, uh, in, in, in a class, um, in a typical year, maybe we spend a little bit of time doing one of these examples or two of these examples. I think we've done enough to get the idea, the gist of it. Um, but what we would do, we used GeoGebra quite a bit here already, but we would take our theta values and we would plug them into the equation, get an R value back, right? We would then plot our first point. Okay, make sure you understand that. And I like to put labels on it. I'll just write like one underneath it. Um, and then I'll plot my second point. I'll probably put a two next to it. And then I'll keep doing that, plot all the points that I have, and then I'll connect them in the order that I generated them, and I've got my graph. Does that make sense? But the pull, the, all you got to do is you got to you got to understand how we graph things in polar. We have to be able to evaluate um, correctly with our sine and cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent functions. Um, that's how you would graph a polar graph. Okay, so um, those are there. If you want to spend a little bit of time on those on your own doing that, I'm not going to require much of you in regards to that. Okay. What I really want to talk about is um, an introduction today to complex numbers, because this is kind of where we're going to live for the remaining part of the year, Okay, working with complex numbers. Okay. Um, you guys have, rem or hopefully you remember, we had a section in algebra of this. Uh, you did it in college algebra, did it in algebra 2. Um, if I asked you guys to take like 2 minus 2i, let's actually make it 12 minus 2i, uh, times 12 minus 2i. You guys remember how to do that? Yes. How? Uh, Just what technique would you use? You'd FOIL that, correct? Yes. Okay. What if I asked you to go 12 minus 2i again? You'd FOIL those two, right? Yes. And that's going to give you, so if I, just, just help me out here, what's, what's 12 times 12? 144 minus what ends up being 48 i's, and then you'll have plus 4 i squared. But what's i squared the same as? Negative one. So you have plus 4 i 
squared, which ends up being minus 4, correct? So then you would have 140 minus 48i times now 12 minus 2i if I wanted to do this multiplication, right? And then what are you going to have to do again? FOIL again, right? But what if I asked you to do that? My hopes are you would recognize, well, that I've already done, so now it would be 140 minus 48i times another 140 minus 48i, right? But what if I asked you to do this? And I'd have to FOIL that garbage and then do 12 minus 2i, right? And I'd have to FOIL all that. So it could be an elongated process depending on what I ask you, okay? What's another way of being able to write this line right here? Okay. So the, the algebraic, the rectangular version of that is what we just did. And that's very time-consuming and tedious, and there's a lot of places to make errors. What we're going to start talking about today, and probably finish up maybe tomorrow and Monday, is how I can take 12 minus 2i, which you have no idea how to graph that yet. Okay? But we're going to look at what this graph is, and then hopefully draw the connection that, oh, I can, I can move rectangular, rectangularly to 12 minus 2i, but I can also move polarly, if that's a word, to 12 minus 2i, okay? And then I can figure out what would be the polar coordinate for 12 minus 2i, okay? Right now, it's a rectangular coordinate. If we are able to put it in polar and understand what that looks like in polar, then the polar version of 12 minus 2i raised to the fifth power, you can probably multiply that out in maybe six or seven seconds where doing the rectangular might be taking you 20, 25 minutes to do. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So it's going to allow us to um, really condense our algebra real easy. Okay. What we find out as we get into more complex algebra, that working rectangularly can be cumbersome. It can be nasty. But if we can convert to something that allows us to manipulate the work a little bit easier, get an answer, in that version, so, so we go from rectangular, convert it to polar, do the easy algebra in polar, and then unconvert back into rectangular. I got my rectangular answer, but I never had to do any algebra rectangularly. Does that make sense? And that's, that's the hope that we can, we can do a little bit of that um, with these complex numbers. Okay? Um, complex numbers used quite a bit in um, electrical engineering. Okay, with like ohms and resistance and that kind of stuff. Um, electrical currents, we like to have multiple um, quantities uh, being identified or being used to represent um, currents. Uh, complex numbers establish that for us. Okay, um, talk about complex numbers real quick. What are they? Okay, so let's start with our smallest group of numbers that we are aware of, which are our natural numbers. Yes. Okay, now we also then have our natural numbers plus zero, okay, which I'm going to, a lot of times you see different notations for this, you might see N with a plus sign, okay, you might see N, and that plus sign might be a subscript, superscript, um, you might see a zero there for as a superscript or a subscript, but that's our whole numbers, right, so it's our natural numbers plus that number zero. Uh, then outside that we have our integers, yes? Okay, what is the group that's outside our integers? Say again? So remember, natural numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and on infinity, natural numbers are 0, 1, or sorry, whole numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Integers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and they're opposites. What are we missing so far? Decimals, fractions, that kind of stuff, right? So we get our rational numbers, which we call Q. Q standing for quotient, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so what are we still missing to make our real number line? Irrational numbers. Okay, so irrational numbers like pi, radical 2, radical 3, those types of things, those are everything that are not rational, right? The prefix ir tells us it's everything else that's not rational. So... We denote that with a Q 
superscript C, and that C stands for complement. Okay, so it's everything else, right? We know what our rational numbers are, then irrational must be everything else that is not rational. Okay? Um, so what do we what do we get if we group those together? Okay, so we group those together and we get our real number line. So that is the number line that you are most familiar with. Okay. All right. There's a number and it's 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 an invention. Okay. Um and it's 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 found foundation or it's, it's the logic behind it is how do we answer the question x squared plus one equals zero? How do I solve that um, algebraic rectangular equation? And the only solution that we have when x squared plus one equals zero is i, right? Does that make sense? Square root of negative one. So what we do is we have another group of numbers over here. Okay, I, M, standing for imaginary, and they're the product of what radical negative one is equal to, so it's I, right? So they might be something like one I, two I, three I, negative one I, negative two I, one half I, those types of things, okay? We call those numbers purely imaginary, okay? But they are rooted in that square root of negative one, okay? So what we do then is we kind of do the same thing that we did when we had these, when we had just these two groups. When we had those two groups, we grouped them together, right? And created this overarching collective set called the reals. Well, now we have the same thing. We have the reals as one set, the imaginary as another set. We're going to group them together into one overarching group of numbers. Anybody know what we call these? Starts with a C, complex numbers. Okay. Complex numbers are all of the form A plus BI. Okay, where A comes from this list here, or this set. Okay, A is your real component. The B comes from this stuff, or the BI comes from that stuff. Does that make sense? A is your real component, BI is your imaginary component, okay? So let's get some examples here of what would be a complex number, okay? Give me a number that's in the blue. Any number you think of. Seven, okay? Seven's in the blue. Give me a number that would be in the green. Five I. There's a complex number, okay? Now, any number you give me in the blue. So I got I negative four. Any number over here, one half I. Complex number, right? What's what's a what's a unique number that would be in this this blue stuff? Okay, so 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 you go going, you're gonna go negative four plus now over here would be zero zero i is over here. Does that make sense? Okay, now would you ever write that that way? No, because zero times anything is zero. So instead of writing it as negative four plus zero i, we write it as negative four. Well, negative four that's a lot of things, right? That's a, is it a natural number? It is? No, natural number starts at one and goes to positive thing, right? So the first number, first group that belongs to is an integer, right? But then it's a rational number, it's a real number, and it's also a complex number. Because as, as I find its initial position, where the, the innermost kind of set that it belongs to, and I find that location, so in this case it would be Z, then it's a member of everything that is bigger than Z, right? Or everything that can encapsulate Z. So Q, R, and C all do that, okay? So negative four is a complex number. Usually we don't refer to it and talk about it as a complex number, okay? Especially since we really haven't ever mentioned complex numbers, um, other than the little bit, maybe a week or so of 
you know, if we collectively go talk about how much we've done A plus BI in the last two years, it might be maybe two weeks worth of work, okay, um, if that. But negative four, complex number, okay. What about, but we, we usually gener or generally say that it's like purely real. Does that make sense? Okay, because there is no imaginary component there. What if I, is zero in this list? Is zero in the blue? What if I go zero plus 4i? Would you ever write it that way? You just write it as 4i, right? Okay. That's still complex. Okay. Because the green list of imaginary numbers is part of that broader set of values. That's the complex point. So, 4i, though it is complex, a lot of times we just say it's purely imaginary. Okay. But anything that's purely imaginary is also complex. Anything that's purely real is also complex. Does that kind of make sense? So here's the argument. Give me a number. Any number you ever can imagine. Complex number. Give me another number. Complex number. Give me something bizarre. Okay, plus radical 3i. Complex number. Does that make sense? Anything that you can say complex number okay does that make sense um now on number lines you you've always been able to graph a real number okay on a basically all you need is a real number line you need essentially an x-axis right that's what our x-axis is a real number line if we wanted to plot ordered pairs in our ordered pairs in our rectangular system our x-axis was one real number line and it took place of or took care of the x coordinate. Our y axis was another real number line and it took care of our y coordinate because our y was also a real number. Does that make sense? Okay. Now if I want to plot a imaginary number, you think about what we did back in geometry when like, the first day of geometry, when we learned about these number systems, I put on the board like I put like a dot for one, and then I put a dot for two, and then a dot for three, and a dot for four, because those were our natural numbers, right? And then I put, when we went to the next set of numbers, we put a dot for zero, because it added now a number to the list, right? And then we went to integers, so now I put a dot for all those uh, negative numbers. So we had just a, a very um, long kind of diagram of just dots, but there's a lot of gaps between those dots or those points, right? So then we talked about the rational numbers and that filled in a lot and so it found like one half two thirds three fourths uh 11 15 those kind of things right and it filled in a lot of those gaps that were established by you know the the integers okay but then that was still a whole lot there's an infinite number of gaps still there right so then we started to fill in the imagine or sorry not the, the the irrational values and once we filled in all the irrational values there were no more gaps right and we had a solid number line, correct? So if that, if, if we looked at the real numbers and we had a solid number line, and now we're talking about, well, how do I plot a complex number? There's no spots for them, right? There are no gaps anymore for complex numbers because the real numbers took care of all the gaps. So how do we graph a complex number? How do we plot that? And this is the process that we go through. We have to do it in what we call the complex plane, okay? Um, this is sometimes referred to as an R GAN diagram. Okay, I think Web Assign will call it an R GAN diagram. R GAN is the, the guy that developed it. Okay. Basically what happens is that you take your real axis and which is your X axis, you leave that alone. Okay, so it's gonna be your real axis. Your vertical axis now is what we refer to as the imaginary axis. Okay. Um, and you're going to see different notation. Uh, here I've got the words written out. A lot of times you might just see the, you know, the capital R for a real, and you'll see um, like I, M for imaginary. Pretty self-explanatory though. Um, you might see like this being A, and they might call this BI. But that's how we're going to do it. So if, if I have, and I've got a list of points up here we'll talk about z equals 3 plus 2i so z is just the um the notation that we use to distinguish that we're talking about a complex number okay 
Um, there, there's a course called Complex Analysis in which I, they probably maybe discuss why they use Z. Don't worry about why it's Z, but uh, whenever you see that, it's, they're talking about a complex number. Um, I'm just going to use a subscript of one right here because we have a bunch of Z's. So what we do is we uh, first identify what is the real component there. What is the real number there? It's three, right? Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to travel out to three on your real axis. Okay. What is your imaginary component? 2i. So you're going to go up to 2i, and that's how you plot that point. Okay. We will talk eventually about adding this vector. Okay. But if you think about it, you just moved rectangular from 0 to 3 plus 2i, right? Okay. We can move polarly there as well, and that's what we'll get into in the next several days. 